Hello, my name is Sarah Short, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about how to compile to analog devices with our compilation tool chain, Legno. This is joint work with Martin Reinard and uh, I'm part of a collaboration with Giannis Fetus and Columbia University. And we are from MIT, CCL, and MIT EICS. So before I talk about compiling to these devices, I do need to introduce these devices more formally. Now, the devices I'll be talking about today are CMOS chips uh, that basically leverage the analog behavior of transistors to perform computation. Now, these devices are digitally, digitally reconfigurable, which means that we can reprogram them on the fly by digitally set, setting bits to implement a variety of different computations. Now, these devices have two key performance characteristics that make them attractive for performing computation. First, they are low energy systems, so they are able to perform computation using microjoules of energy and consume between microwatts to milliwatts of power. Second, the execution time is constant with respect to the complexity of the computation. So whether you're executing a small computation or a large computation, it should conceivably take the same amount of time. Now these devices, the devices that I'm targeting today, uh, are especially adept at executing dynamical systems. They are designed for executing dynamical systems. Now what is a dynamical system? A dynamical system is a mathematical primitive we see in a variety of different domains. We see it in chemistry, physics, biology, machine learning even uh, nowadays, signal processing, uh, controls, and so on. Uh, now, you might ask, well, what can we do with a dynamical system? Well, there's a couple, a couple interesting uh, use cases for them. The first is you can use them to get a deeper understanding of a physical phenomenon. So you can, for example, observe some physical phenomenon and then mathematically model it using a dynamical system. You can then execute that dynamical system under a variety of different conditions to gain a deeper understanding of the phenomenon you're studying. Something else you can do with dynamical systems is you can couple them with sensors and you can use them to analyze your surroundings. There are a couple of things you can do here. You can, for example, try to extract higher order information from the sensor information. So you, for example, you could imagine observing sensor information and then trying to extract the position of somebody's hand from it. You can also do anomaly detection. So you can basically observe a signal over time and then you can identify when there's anomalous behavior in that signal. Uh, and you can take this one step further and you can use dynamical systems to react to the environment. So you can basically take this dynamical system that's processing a sensor input and then you can hook it up to an actuator and you can use a dynamical system to affect the environmental conditions. A classic example of this is a thermostat, which observes the temperature in a room and then adjusts the heating element in a room to reach a target temperature. Similarly, you can monitor the blood sugar levels in a person and then you can adjust the insulin levels to meet a target blood sugar level. All right, so how do these analog devices execute computation? Well, it's a, it's a, a little bit non-standard. Uh, so basically, these analog devices contain collections of computational blocks. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they are digitally programmable, which means you can hook them up to a digital computer and you can basically use this digital computer to configure the device. And there's two different ways you can program it. The first is you can enable connections within the device to form circuits. So depending on the connections you enable, you can form a variety of different circuits within the device internally. The second way you can program this device is by setting bits within each of the blocks. As, and basically what, what this does is it changes the function implemented by the block. So you can basically set bits in the blocks that you're interested in using to get the desired functions from it. So basically the goal here is to use these two programming techniques to form a circuit comprised of configured blocks where the physics of the circuit, the, the physical behavior of the analogs and analog currents and voltages in the circuit is analogous to the dynamical system that you wish to model. And so basically by watching the trajectories of the currents and voltages, you can understand how your variables evolve in your dynamical system over time. So once you've configured your, your analog device to uh, implement, the, implement the dynamical system you're interested in. So for example, let's say we've configured this analog device so that the dynamics of the circuit model the physics of a car, uh, the way you would run this dynamical system is you would power on the device and then you would observe the trajectory of the uh, analog currents moving through the wires over time. Uh, and you would, uh, you would focus on the, cur the currents moving through the wires that you're interested in. So for example, you can imagine that we're interested in the analog currents moving through the two highlighted wires. And the reason why we'd be interested in monitoring these currents over time is because they correspond to characteristics of our dynamical system. For example, this current could correspond to the velocity of the car and this current might correspond to the position of the car. Now, the compilation problem, therefore, is given a dynamical system uh, that we want to implement on the analog device and given a specification of the analog device that describes all of the blocks and connections at our disposal and how the, how the blocks can be programmed, uh, basically, can we synthesize a configuration for the analog device 
uh, that when programs, that when written to the, to the hardware, implements a dynamical system, namely configures the hardware so the physics of the hardware is analogous to the dynamical system dynamics. Now, there has been some prior work in this area. However, this prior work tar targeted models of the analog device and was evaluated in simulation. In con contrast, this work targets a physical, a physical analog device and was evaluated on actual hardware. And what we found in targeting this physical analog device is that there was actually a gap between the anticipated behavior of the analog device captured by the models in previous work and the actual physical behavior of the analog device that we observed. So in this talk, I'll be presenting the first ever compilation tool chain for a real world reconfigurable analog device in this class. Okay, so what are the characteristics I'm talking about? What are the characteristics of these physical analog devices? Well, for one, the blocks are highly parametric. So consider, for example, this multiplier block, which takes as input and two analog inputs, x and y, and a digitally settable constant c. It produces as output a current at z. This block also accepts as input a digitally settable mode, which can be set to one of nine different values pictured here. Now, the modes can have two different effects. The first effect a mode may have is it may, may change the function implemented by, implemented by the block. So you can basically set the mode to implement one of a variety of different functions. Uh, you can see with the multiplier block here, when the multiplier is put into medium high mode, it implements 10 times C times X. Whereas when it's placed in medium, medium high mode, it implements five times X times Y. The second effect the mode may have is it may change the operating conditions of the block or the analog behavior of the block. For example, when the multiplier is set in medium, medium, medium mode, the analog currents provided to X and Y must be between negative two and two microamps. Whereas when the block is put in medium high, high mode, the input current provided to X still has to fall within negative two and two microamps. However, the input current provided to Y is now extended and it may fall uh, between a larger dynamic range of negative 20 to 20 microamps. Another characteristic of these physical analog devices have is there's a lot of blocks that are actually not used for computation. For example, we have several kinds of blocks that are used to route signals throughout the device. So in order to be able to form connections between some blocks within the device, you need to basically include additional blocks, which I call route blocks, uh, to form that connection. Other blocks are used to copy signals in the device. And this is because, uh, we're, since we're using analog currents to perform computation here, uh, and the, the hardware does not actually hide the physical behavior of currents from us, meaning that we want to use an analog current in more than one place, we have to copy it first, because if you just route analog currents to more than one place, you will end up changing the value carried on that line. And so hence, the, the, that's why there are copier blocks available on this hardware. Similarly, uh, not all computation is actually performed with blocks. For example, you might expect for there to be an adder block on the device. However, the way addition is performed is by leveraging the physical behavior of analog currents. So basically, we perform addition within the device by forming connections, by routing connections to the same place. Uh, because due to Kirchhoff's law, the sum of currents at a join point is zero. So if you have two incoming currents with values A and B, the outgoing current will, be, will, will carry the, the, the current uh, A plus B, the current, level, the current with a level A plus B. So in addition to these behaviors that kind of uh, make implementing computation a little bit more complicated, these analog blocks have analog behaviors that we did not previously anticipate. So in previous work, we, we looked at uh, handling operating range limitations and frequency limitations to some degree. However, real an physical analog devices actually have uh, analog noise associated with them. They have quantization as a result of uh, con configuring the digital values within each of the blocks. And because we're leveraging the transistors, the analog behavior of transistors, because we're fabricating such a device, the manufacturing or process variations that affect the behavior of transistors actually change the function implemented by the device, so for the function implemented by each block. So now we have to also consider the analog noise, the quantization error, a more complicated frequency constraints, and of course, the manufacturing variation introduced by the fabrication process. And what makes things more complicated is all these behaviors depend on the selected mode. Okay, so if we revisit the comp compiler we talked about earlier, in order for this compiler to be able to faithfully target the hardware we're talking about, we need this compiler to be able to target parametric blocks effectively, intelligently use special purpose blocks when needed, leverage the analog current laws to perform additional computation, and handle all the analog behaviors we just talked about. 
Okay, so how does this compiler work? Well, it takes as input a dynamical system specification, which is written by the domain specialist and describes the dynamical system we wish to execute on the analog device. And it takes as input an analog device specification, which is provided by the hardware designer and describes the available blocks and connections on the analog device. And of course, provides a behavioral specification for each block, which includes all of the parametric behavior of the block. The compiler also takes as input an empirical model database. This empirical model database is automatically elicited by profiling the chip on hand and contains all of the empirically derived manufacturing variation models for the blocks on the device. The compiler produces as an output an analog device program, which describes how to configure each of the blocks and which connections to enable on the analog device. Here's an example analog device program. This particular program implements a harmonic oscillator, which you can think of as a mass attached to a spring. The, the, this particular program models two characteristics of the mass. It models the position and velocity. As you can see, there are two wires labeled P and V. And what, what this means is that the analog currents moving through these wires uh, correspond to the position and the velocity of the mass over time. Now you'll also notice that there are connections between each of the blocks. So these connections correspond to digitally programmable connections that may be enabled within the device. Similarly, you'll see that each of these blocks uh, has a yellow speech bubble associated with it, labeled with a mode. And what this does is it tells us how we're programming each of the blocks. So for example, multiplier two is configured. So C, the digitally settable constant C is equal to two and the multiplier being placed in MM mode. Conversely, multiplier one is also being set in MM mode, but is being initialized so that the digitally settable constant C is equal to 0 0.5. Okay, so now that we understand the inputs and outputs of the compiler, let's talk a little bit more about the internals of the compiler. So compilation is broken up into two major phases. There's circuit synthesis, which involves synthesizing the analog circuit, uh, that synthesizing an analog circuit that implements a dynamical system. This, this step, it basically ignores all of the analog behaviors and analog limitations we listed earlier. And then we have circuit scaling, which basically scales the analog circuit to account for all the behavior and analog limitations that we talked about. Now the circuit synthesis process actually is broken up into three smaller stages, sub-circuit synthesis, assembly, and place and route. Sub-circuit synthesis involves taking all the blocks that perform computation and Kirchhoff's law if necessary, and basically composing together these blocks using Kirchhoff's law as needed to implement each of the relations in the dynamical system. For example, if we take the following relations, which describe the behavior of the harmonic oscillator we talked about earlier, the, the sub-circuit synthesis stage will produce three sub-circuits. It will produce a sub-circuit that models the observed P statement, which basically consists of a CL block and a, P, and a wire marker indicating we need the position P to be provided. Provide, it generates a sub-circuit that models the position over time, which basically consists of a multiplier and an integrator, uh, where the output of the integrator provides the position or models the position. And the input, uh, the, the velocity must be provided into port P, P of the multiplier block. And uh, produces one last sub-circuit, which models the velocity over time. This sub-circuit, again, uses an integrator and a multiplier and requires that a negated position to be provided into input port Q. And it emits the velocity V as an output of the integrator block. So once we have these sub-circuits that implement each of the relations uh, provided in our dynamical system, we then take these sub-circuits and we assemble them together to form the completed circuit. This circuit implements the dynamical system we provided as input. Now this stage will insert copy blocks as needed to basically get enough copies of each of the signals uh, to form the circuit. So if we take the sub-circuits we talked about earlier, what we're going to do here is we're basically going to connect the blue circles, which are where signals are being generated, to where they're needed, which are the uh, gray rectangles. So when we do this, you'll see that um, we form the following completed circuit. And you might notice we insert one copy block. This is because the position P is being used in two places. It's being used in the observed P statement and it's being used in the statement that models the velocity of the harmonic oscillator over time. And that leaves us with the last stage, place and route, which basically assigns blocks in our circuit to blocks on the device and connections in our circuit to digitally settable connections with the device. This stage inserts route blocks when necessary. So again, if we take this assembled circuit that we generated in the previous step, after the place and route procedure, we'll find that each of the blocks has been assigned an instance and we have inserted a, one additional route block, the tout block, to make this connection feasible. So next, the compiler scales the analog circuit to account for any analog behaviors present in the device and any limitations on the computation that are imposed by the design of the device. 
Now this uh, scaling process basically is divided into three stages uh, and, and, has, and basically does two things. It, first, uh, it will first select the modes uh, out of the set of viable modes for each block. This mode selection procedure is performed as the second step of scaling. Uh, so the output of this procedure is basically an analog device program with all the modes selected, uh, but it's the, with no scaling transform applied yet. The next stage of the scaling process involves computing a scaling transform. This scaling transform uh, is basically used to scale the analog device program. And basically the way this works is uh, once it's applied, the resulting scaled analog device program runs a different dynamical system. However, this dynamical system is structured in such a way where we can recover the original dynamics of our dynamical system at runtime by inverting the scaling transform computed by the compiler. So let's talk a little bit more about this scaling transform. So this scaling transform is composed of a set of signal scale factors for every single value and every single port in the circuit, as well as a time scale factor which controls the speed of the simulation or the speed of the dynamical system. The way we apply the scale transform is we multiply each of our digitally settable constants by the associated signal scale factor. What this does is it scales all of these signals internally so they propagate through the analog device while still respecting all the physical restrictions and analog behaviors uh, present in the device. The scaling transform also has the additional effect of, adi of altering the execution speed of the dynamical system to match the desired execution speed. Now, once we've scaled the analog device program, we can recover the original dynamics at runtime uh, from any port in the system. We're going to choose the port M on the OBS block by applying the following inverting transform. So basically we measure the signal, in this case, the signals in terms of microamps and the times in terms of microsecond. And then what we do is we divide the amplitude of the signal by the scaling factor associated with that port. And then we divide time by the uh, mapping of dynamical system time to wall clock time. This is tau times 7.93. Tau is the mapping of dynamical system time to hardware time, and 7.93 is the mapping between hardware time and wall clock time. Once we do this, uh, we are able to recover the, the, the trajectory of the signal in dynamical system units. So because we're monitoring the position of the harmonic oscillator at this port, you'll see that the, we recover the position in meters and the time in dynamical system time units. Okay, so both mode selection and scaling transform generation are performed by solving the universal scaling constraint problem. This scaling constraint problem is basically a convex optimization problem with SMT constraints in it. It has continuous variables, which basically consist of all of the scaling factors, so the time scaling factor and all the signal scaling factor, and then it has discrete variables. Uh, more specifically, there is a discrete variable for each mode to select. So basically, you can solve the UCSP, UCSP with a uh, an SMT solver to get a set of mode selections. These mode selections are guaranteed to produce a satisfying set, a satisfying scaling transform. So what you can do at this point is you can apply the mode selections to the USCCP uh, to get a convex optimization problem. Once you apply these mode selections, all of the SMT constraints go away and you get a, you just get a geometric programming problem, which is a form of a convex optimization problem. You can then pl plug it into the conv convex optimizer which is with your favorite objective function. Uh, since tau is one of our variables, uh, we can do things like maximize the execution speed subject to all of our, our mode selections and subject to all of the constraints, and we get our scaling transform by solving this problem. So the convex optimization problem is kind of the core, uh, the, the, the core problem in the universal scaling constraint problem. And again, we formulate it as a geometric programming pro problem. There's many different kinds of constraints in this problem. Uh, there are constraints that ensure, that basically encode the physical limitations of the analog device and the physical behaviors of the analog device. Uh, these come in the form of operating range constraints and execution speed constraints, uh, as well as quality constraints and factor constraints which encode the manufacturing variations of the device. There are also constraints that ensure we are able to recover the dynamical system, the original dynamical system at every stage of, the, at every point in the circuit. And these come in the form of connection and factor constraints. Okay, so now that we covered the compiler, we can now talk about the results. So here are the results. So as I mentioned before, I targeted a real analog device. Uh, the device I targeted was the HCDC V2 analog device, which was developed by Columbia, Giannis Venus' group at Columbia University, and then licensed to Sendai Corporation. I ran a variety of, I compiled a variety of different programs to this hardware. Uh, here are 12 of them. Some of these programs are for my collaborators. 
And some of these programs are for my own prior work and also programs that I thought would be interesting to execute on such a, on such a chip. Uh, two examples of these are the uh, common filter and the PI controller. So here are the dynamics that we expect for each of the uh, 12 benchmarks. And here are the trajectories that are measured. So I basically measure these with an oscilloscope, right? And I apply that inverting transform I talked about. And as you can see, so basically the measured signals are in blue and the reference signals are orange. So you can see that actually uh, many of these uh, signals, many of the measured signals closely track the reference signals. And in some cases are uh, virtually indistinguishable from the reference signal. Now, the uh, performance characteristics of these, uh, of these benchmarks are also fairly attractive. Uh, we were able to execute all these benchmarks under, using under a milliwatt of power. And uh, because these benchmarks took between 0.5 to 6.58 milliseconds to execute, uh, we were able to complete these executions using 0.28 microjoules to 5.67 microjoules of energy. So here are my contributions. Uh, I will now take any questions. Thank you.